So it's 12 o'clock. And uh, welcome to this seminar, um, which will be given by, by Matthew Krishtiniak. I hope you can all hear me. I can see attendees still coming. So maybe we can wait for a couple of minutes until the number stabilizes a bit more. Matthew, I'm hoping that you can see you can see me and hear me. Yes, I can. Okay. And then at some point after the introduction, I will I will be um, letting you um, share the screen and uh, do the honors. So uh, it's already a bit past 12. Uh, let me welcome you to the seminar, which will be given by Matthew Krishtiniak. Um, it is actually a great pleasure to introduce Matthew, uh, whom I have known for a very long time now, well over a decade, uh, and give you a few words about Matthew. Matthew earned his PhD in physics from one of the uh, most venerable and oldest universities uh, in Europe, Jagiellonian University in beautiful Krakow in Poland. And for the past few years, Matthew has been working as a scientist uh, at uh, my previous home, actually, the uh, Isis Pulse Neutron Immune Source at the Rutherford Appleton Labs in the UK. Prior to his uh, current appointment and work, Matthew was a senior lecturer in physical chemistry at Nottingham Trent University as well as before that individual research fellow with the German Research Foundation, as well as EU Curie fellow across Berlin and Rutherford. That was the time when I, I had the, uh, the pleasure to, to meet Matthew for the first time. So in a nutshell, Matthew will be telling you much more about, about this. Matthew's research interests can be summarized on a very strong focus on the development of new ways of looking and understanding nuclear quantum effects uh, in the lab through experiments using a broad range and already a broad, very broad range of neutron scattering techniques in close tandem with computational materials modeling. So I'm hoping that uh, that tandem, and that uh, synergy would be, would be a matter of discussion as well and a subject of discussion uh, throughout the questions after Matthew's presentation. Uh, obviously today, Matthew will be telling us much more about these and without further ado, uh, Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome everybody and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the seminar. Um, as uh, Felix said, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about nuclear quantum effects as they are now entering the mainstream of research. And um, without further ado, I'll just uh, start by saying that the talk will be roughly divided into three parts. Why we are doing new, new quantum effects? Uh, what do we mean by nuclear quantum effects in terms of observables phenomena that we can attribute to nuclear quantum effects? And actually, um, when we speak about what, do we, what we mean by nuclear quantum effects, we have to also speak about how we want to tackle um, uh, the problems related to the manifestations of nuclear quantum effects in solid state systems and molecules, how we want to measure them. Uh, last but not least, there are obviously still challenges associated with nuclear quantum effects measurements and simulations to which I should um, devote the last part of my talk. 
So uh, why uh, um, are we doing this? Uh, let me start with a historical perspective. Um, it's been almost a decade since uh, a great, I'm sorry, since a great upsurge of uh, um, theoretical and computational activity in terms of nuclear quantum effects. It has been a constant dialogue between experiment and theory. Um, driven by the data, this dialogue has led to a um, flurry of theoretical activity of people across uh, the continent and uh, in United States, but also in places that are closer to your hearts, um, with a very prominent Spanish accent here of uh, uh, Jordi Boronat from uh, Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, who was actually one of the first um, scientists who interpreted nuclear quantum effects measured on uh, instrument that I'm responsible for, Vesuvio, using path integral related methods. Um, and then um, those theoretical considerations led to um, cross-pollination between experiments and theory, uh, which in the end led to um, much easier identification of um, uh, nuclear quantum effects in solid state systems and molecules and actually gave pointers to the researchers, to the experimentalists, where to look for them, which observables to use in order to characterize them, and also gave a challenge to theoreticians to simulate the experimental results. One of the most iconic um, pictures that are always shown by both experimentalists and theoreticians um, in terms of you know, motivation, why we are doing nuclear quantum effects, is the case of water, uh, which is actually the most puzzling nuclear quantum uh, system, both uh, in its liquid and solid state. One of the ways of thinking about a classical to quantum transition in terms of nuclear quantum degrees of freedom is to think of a, um, a classical particle as a particle that obviously obeys the laws of quant quant uh, classic physics, classical physics, no quantum physics, and uh, this particle would be approximated by an infinite mass. And in that case, we can use uh, the, um, I'm sorry, something is leaping here. We can use the um, experimental results um, about um, pH, for instance, and um, a heat capacity of isotopically pure water and extrapolate them to infinite uh, mass of the proton. And actually we reach a situation in which a pH of isotropically uh, pure water um, for a classical proton nuclei in, in water would have been 8.5, which is uh, actually quite a poisonous environment compared to what we know from real life. Also the heat capacity of an isotropically pure water uh, consisting of classical nuclei would have been completely off compared to what we know from the measurement, um, thereby rendering life as we know it pro probably uh, impossible. Um, as far as the solid state is concerned, Actually, historically speaking, the first investigations of nuclear quantum effects have been in um, uh, as far as me mechanical properties of strongly correlated quantum systems are concerned. Uh, in helium, uh, we know uh, about giant plasticity uh, in helium at, at low temperature. Um, but more generally, when we talk about phase diagrams uh, of, of uh, quantum systems, nuclear quantum systems, we have to not forget about the existence of zero point energy fluctuations, which position the particles not at the bottom of the potential energy landscapes as if they were completely classical particles would have been there. Uh, instead, being quantum um, entities, they exhibit those um, zero point energy fluctuations that position them well above the bottom of the local minima in the potential energy landscape, which translates into complete recharting of phase boundaries of strongly quantum crystals like, like water and crystals of light made out of lightweight uh, nuclei, shifting them mostly to the lower temperature and, and um, uh, pressure values. The phase boundaries are obvious, obviously um, uh, those uh, including uh, quantum effects are shifted downwards in temperature and pressure. Uh, most interestingly for metastable uh, matter and matter which is not exactly in equilibrium, um, in glasses and metastable systems, nuclear quantum effects are thought of uh, being responsible for actually both um, 
arresting the structural relaxation leading to um, glass formation at higher temperatures and preventing the glass formations at low temperatures. Um, so there is this re-entrant phenomena in terms of um, uh, liquid to, to, to glass phase boundaries if we take into account nuclear quantum effects. Obviously in, um, in system, uh, systems that are hydrogen bonded, most iconically, um, obviously hydrogen bonds are strongly affected by uh, the presence of nuclear quantum effects. We have here an interplay of um, proton sharing and delocalization and hydrogen bond bending and distortion. So we can think of helper modes, which are the modes that would be directed along the oxygen-oxygen um, distance that would strengthen the um, strengths of the hydrogen bond using the, uh, these modes and their uh, nuclear quantum properties and the modes that would be destroying or weakening and um, the hydrogen bond. And this is this interplay in uh, water um, and water containing systems that actually describes properly, as we know now, uh, hydrogen bonds in terms of um, their strengths and, and properties using nuclear quantum effects. Um, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself uh, Matthew if I were not referring briefly to nuclear magnetic resonance as part of my career was also devoted apart from doing neutrons to nuclear magnetic resonance. And I, as an ambitious postdoc many years ago, I was trying to do something which is now referred to as um, nuclear uh, magnetic resonance crystallography, whereby you exploit the um, dependency of nuclear magnetic observables such as chemical shifts or spin-spin couplings on the bond length and positions of protons inside of the hydrogen bonds. And uh, obviously this has been um, in many respects um, and not a complete success just because the DFT theory that was used many years ago was not very well accounting for the chemical shifts, but also um, just because the most prominent part of uh, NMR community still using proton NMR as a tool. Um, and 10 years ago, people were not able to simulate those um, dependencies of nuclear magnetic re uh, resonance observables of protons on um, uh, bond length distances using uh, path integral molecular dynamics uh, methods. Now there is an upsurge of uh, new methodology, uh, which shows that there is a cons uh, considerable smearing out of the relationships between uh, positions and uh, of, of protons inside the molecules and nuclear magnetic observables. Um, part of the questions is about nuclear quantum effects is where to find them and how, which observables should we use as, as, as yardsticks for um, searching for nuclear quantum effects in, in um, solid state systems and molecules. One of the parameters which is widely used by both theoreticians and experimentalists is the uh, lambda star de Burr parameter, which roughly sp speaking is the ratio of the thermal wavelength um, to the interparticle separation. It is used in the context of quantum crystals. It was actually also used a lot by Boronat in his review um, uh, um, that he published on quantum crystals to categorize which systems could be uh, usual suspects in terms of um, very prominently exhibiting nuclear quantum effects. Um, and we can see that they exist in almost all classes of, 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 uh, of crystals and uh, all classes of chemical bonds, starting from uh, metallic through covalent ionic and molecular systems and also in rare gases, um, just to um, name a few um, quite uh, interesting cases in the metallic systems. We have lithium, which is a lightweight nucleus, but also magnesium exhibiting large values of this lambda star parameter. Uh, in covalent systems, we have carbonaceous systems. In ionic um, uh, crystals, an iconic system is uh, lithium hydride, um, uh, where nuclear quantum effects are both on prominent on hydrogen and lithium. In molecular systems, a plethora of um, of molecular um, systems of lightweight nuclei and medium weight nu nuclei. And uh, in rare gases, obviously the lighter ones uh, that were actually historically um, the ones that were first investigated in terms of position and momentum distributions of nuclei. Um, one of the most accurate um, yardsticks of uh, nuclear quantum effects used uh, very prominently by chemists uh, who actually tackle problems of atmospheric chemistry and geologists um, 
uh, uh, are fractionation ratios. And roughly speaking, obviously, they are ratios of the ratios of the isotope abundances of two chosen isotopes, be it H and D, for instance, in two phases, which are in um, equilibrium in, uh, along the coexistence line, we can uh, basically measure the ratios of the abundances of both isotopes in two phases, like liquid and water. And their ratios we call fractionation ratios. And they are also uh, obviously um, telling us about the fate of certain isotopes in the atmosphere, about the circulation of the atmos atmospheric hydrogen and deuterium between liquid, solid, and, and, and uh, vapor phase. Um, in terms of uh, geological observables, they also tell us about metabolic activity and organic uh, reactions because they are different in living tissues uh, compared to the soil surrounding them. So they can be actually a very good markers of uh, organic reactions and metabolic activity. But um, mathematically or thermodynamically, um, they are expressed uh, through the Helmholtz free energy corresponding to the exchange process, the chemical reaction describing the isotopy exchange process. And this Helmholtz energy is directly uh, related to the uh, difference of the absolute values of the nuclear kinetic energies of uh, nuclei in both phases. So had it not been for the fact that those nuclei have different affinities they are in different phases, and the physicists would say they are constrained, they are um, embedded in different poten local chemical pot local potentials of different shape, and uh, thereby having different nuclear quantum energies, um, it, it, that would have been, if it wouldn't be the case, the difference of the kinetic energies would be simply given by the kinetic energy energies of the classically part, uh, classical particles uh, um, whose momentum kinetic energy distribution is governed by um, Boltzmann equilibrium and uh, by the difference would have been zero. So actually the fact that we observe isotope fractionation ratios um, uh, is actually a, a testament to the fact that um, nuclear are quantum particles and they are confined and um, described by nuclear Schrodinger equations and uh, nuclear wave functions. Um, as I said, a prominent example is a liquid vapor coexistence line, which has been measured and attempted to simulate um, theoretically using different methods, uh, starting from DFT and uh, also using PIMD, path integral molecular dynamics methods. And actually what's interesting is that as we move along the water vapor coexistence line from lower uh, temperatures, from around room temperature towards higher temperatures, we can see that there is an inversion of the ratios about 500 Kelvin. So actually in the vapor um, uh, deuterium, um, uh, nuclear actually more favorably found than hydrogen. And um, interestingly, apart from um, atomic um, uh, mass spectroscopic methods that are naturally used to measure isotope fractionation uh, ratios, the technique I'm going to talk about uh, nuclear uh, uh, neutron Compton scattering uh, is actually capable, obviously, of uh, measuring uh, new, uh, nuclear kinetic energies uh, with uh, a decent um, uh, precision of um, around two milli electron volts, which translates on uh, around 50 ppm uh, precision on isotopic fractionation ratios. Um, so neutron Compton scattering, as I said, offers a possibility of mass selective spectroscopy of nuclear quantum effects. And I would like to uh, focus your attention on the, on the movie that is now being played in the middle of the slide, which shows what happens if we use epithermal neutrons of energies that have um, that are much higher the binding energy and uh, momentum transfers much higher than um, inverse of the bond length. Uh, as we increase the momentum transfer from the new epithermal neutrons of such high energies to the target nuclei in a molecular condensed matter system, a, a magic happens because um, a spectrum which would have been otherwise neutron weighted, so it would have been spectrum with um, uh, basically no clear contributions from partial uh, vibrational densities of states, this spectrum separates into two um, separate regions, two recoil peaks, as we call them, uh, uh, that shapes are directly proportional to uh, atom projected or partial vibrational densities of states. So unlike in the inelastic neutron scattering regime, where we are sensitive to the collective motions 
um, of um, atoms correlated uh, by um, the virtue of the fact that basically they they share motion within certain modes, so they have uh, obviously correlated motion and uh, given frequency of a mode. Here we're using um, much lower um, wavelengths uh, in the order of the fraction of the um, bond length, and this at this wavelength, neutrons are sensitive to uh, atomic displacements of individual nuclei without picking up the correlations. So we are talking about measuring the sum of atomic displacements of um, individual nuclei, which by definition is, um, if we sum it over all modes present in a given system, it's an atom partial, uh, atom projected partial vibrational density of states. So this is one of not so many nuclear uh, spectroscopic techniques that allows us to measure um, uh, nu nuclear quantum effects associated with zero point energy of the um, atom projected vibrational densities of states in a mass selective manner. And this technique um, is uh, historically the first one that was used at um, electron volt spectrometer EVS, then called Vesuvio, um, as, a, as, a, as a main technique. However, since uh, we started working on um, Vesuvio a couple of years ago together, there was a realization that this instrument offers much more than just one core technique being uh, neutron compton scattering. Um, this technique offers, this instrument offers actually four, uh, if not five different techniques simultaneously that can be performed concurrently on the same sample um, without the need of uh, repositioning it or recalibrating instrument, which is a great asset for any experimentalist. Uh, these techniques are neutron high resolution neutron diffraction in backscattering, neutron transmission in a wide range of incident neutron energies because we are um, using a neutron spallation source that offers us uh, incident neutron energies from epithermal to thermal range. Uh, so a wide range of uh, incident neutron energy dependent transmission spectra. Um, by virtue of the fact that uh, epithermal neutrons are actually quite difficult to detect, we have to resort to neutron gamma resonances to detect them in forward scattering, um, whereby um, a, a foil of metallic um, uh, uh, element is placed on detectors and it, uh, when hit by um, resonantly neut uh, neutron ad uh, adsorbed um, neutrons, produces gamma flashes that are picked up by photomultipliers, and those gamma flashes are obviously uh, excitations of um, uh, 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 nuclei of, uh, of metals placed on um, those detectors that can be also uh, used um, as sources of nuclear quantum effect information. Um, when we place uh, the uh, resonantly absorbing um, elements not uh, in detectors, but in the sample position, and use the gamma uh, sensitive detectors as simply um, detectors of gamma uh, excitations in the sample, we can measure um, those in a time uh, of light resolved manner in different uh, elements, perform elemental analysis and perform do dopplerimetry on the shapes of those um, uh, resonances because they are Doppler broadened by the same virtue of um, the existence of uh, the nuclear quantum effects as much as the Doppler broadening that causes the broadening of uh, neutron Compton scattering peaks. So we have two techniques that actually can be globally used to uh, globally fit the, the nuclear quantum properties in a, in a system under investigation. Um, a very good example of uh, joint um, uh, use of those techniques is actually the picture at the bottom of, of slide that I'm showing, which is a high entropy alloy that um, has uh, multiple recoil peaks that we can observe in neutron Compton scattering, but also some of them are uh, quite overlapping. And if it wasn't uh, for the fact that we can resolve uh, uh, neutron absorption resonances through gamma spectroscopy and uh, we would have never been able to separate uh, the nuclear quantum effects measured from heavy nuclei in this, in this case, molybdenum and neodymium, um, and jointly applying gamma and Compton spectroscopy, we can globally fit those um, zero point energies of all uh, atoms present in this alloy, jointly performing uh, um, neutron transmission and high resolution uh, neutron diffraction on the sample. 
Um, in terms of uh, nuclear quantum observables that we are using, obviously apart from a zero point energy that I uh, already mentioned, um, we have to think about uh, where the nuclear quantum effects come from. And obviously they come from confinement, from binding, from confinement, uh, that uh, is uh, the source of the local effective von Oppenheimer potential in, in which the nucleus sits and um, uh, that uh, zero point energy we are measuring. Um, so there are two extreme cases, as I said, the completely unbound uh, classical uh, nucleus would have been not subject to any confining potential and uh, would have only a kinetic energy that would have been proportional to the temperature. And uh, in such a case, uh, a classical nucleus would exhibit uh, uh, kinetic energy and po po uh, momentum distribution given by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which is this uh, first pinkish or violet rather curve. Um, and obviously in case of nuclear, um, uh, nuclei bound by local potentials, we have the very iconic case of harmonic potential. And then obviously by virtue of the virial theorem, the average value of the nuclear kinetic energy and potential energy are equal. Um, and um, in the parabolic potential, we have um, Gr uh, gram chalier functions that describe uh, the eigenstates of the nuclei and um, Gaussian uh, momentum and kinetic energy distribution, which is markedly uh, different from the classical Maxwell-Boltzmann shape-wise, um, as shown in the slide on the left-hand side, showing those two limiting cases for ice. Um, obviously, uh, we can talk about two different types of momentum distributions, the radial and the longitudinal one by um, virtue of the fact that we are measuring actually a projection of uh, the uh, 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 radial momentum distribution on the momentum transfer, we uh, actually have to use um, the y variable, which is the longitudinal momentum distribution to describe uh, directly measured spectra of uh, momentum distributions on the Zuvio. Uh, but they are obviously related mathematically, we can inter convert them by um, using the Radon transformation that connects them, and there is a whole mathematical apparatus that uh, enables it. Uh, but the main uh, quantum observable is the width of the momentum distribution, which is exactly the same in both representations for the longitudinal and radial momentum distribution. Um, interestingly, when we talk about solid state systems at low temperature, especially those hydrogenous systems, um, the system is no longer described by the density matrix. It, when it cools down is actually its density matrix is proportional to the square of the wave function of uh, the nucleus in the momentum representation. And knowing this and having measured this uh, momentum distribution, we can actually retro engineer the shape of the local born Oppenheimer potential in which the proton uh, is bound, which is a unique uh, feature of, of this type of spectroscopy. Um, it's a model free way of characterizing the um, wave function and the local potential of the proton within a chemical bond, and which enables us to tell whether a um, proton is subject to a, sing a single or double model um, mm, a potential, whether the wave function is uh, subject to a self-interference and tunneling across the hump in the middle, uh, across the uh, hump in the middle between the two local minima, which is the case for bistable systems like hydrogen bonds or where uh, we have uh, the other situation in which we, we have actually a single local minimum and no self-interference of the wave function. So this is a direct blueprint of the local nuclear dynamics beyond the zero point energy effects uh, po uh, possibly to reconstruct the shape of the uh, local potential from directly from the experiment. Obviously in systems uh, where the temperature effect needs to be taken into account. We know that there is a Boltzmann population of the vibrational uh, levels. So uh, the zero point uh, energy nuclear quantum effects need to be accounted for by taking into account the uh, density of states and the Boltzmann population factor. So this is the most um, basic level of simulation of the uh, zero point energies whereby 
uh, one uses the harmonic lattice dynamics and simulates atom projected vibrational densities of states and using this um, the amount of zero point energy uh, of a given uh, nucleus of a given nuclear uh, mass. Um, obviously beyond that using phonon dispersion for instance from lattice dynamics we can characterize the anisotropy of the local binding potential and uh, this anisotropy actually is quite useful for characterizing the directionality of the bonds and directionality of the nuclear quantum effects uh, exhibiting by, exhibited by the nuclei in, inside of those bonds. But you have to be careful what you wish for because sometimes your nuclei don't uh, exhibit this um, uh, anisotropy which would have been predicted by uh, harmonic lattice dynamics which by the way predicts uh, nuclear quantum effects at a very basic, very trivial level, at the level of zero point energy without taking into account the fact that nuclei are um, uh, non-classical um, entities. And this causes obviously problems as uh, shown here in one of our first pioneering works on hydrogen adsorbed in uh, potassium intercalated uh, graphite, uh, whereby we measured the width of the proton momentum distribution. And from the lattice dynamics uh, simulations, we, uh, we were expecting that there is a T-shaped geometry that hydrogen is uh, pinned to the surface of the graphite and it's per perpendicular to it. Um, however, when you perform an experiment whereby you tilt, you rotate the sample um, with respect to the incident um, neutron be uh, beam, uh, you would expect from harmonic lattice uh, dynamics simulations that the momentum distribution given by zero point energy uh, would uh, show uh, a market anisotropy uh, in terms of the rotation angle. However, this is not the case because your nuclei inside your hydrogen molecule are uh, delocalized objects, thereby smearing out any anisotropies of the momentum distributions, as you can see in this slide on the right hand side, where the dotted line is the prediction from the harmonic lattice dynamics and isotropy of the momentum distributions and the uh, points are uh, those from the experiments which are much, much more smeared out as a function of the uh, orientation of the um, sample in the beam. So uh, this very uh, simple example shows that there is a need for path integral molecular dynamic simulations uh, going beyond lattice dynamics in order to account for inherent delocalization of the nuclei and nuclear quantum effects beyond zero point energy effects that can be simulated by lattice dynamics. Uh, what about you know, using your lattice dynamics as a, even if it doesn't match your experiment, what can we tell from this mismatch? Another example of you know, um, uh, profiting from the fact that you have a benchmarking calculation and your experiment is actually not exactly following it. You can still learn from it. Um, and this uh, slide shows the mass resolved study of nuclear quantum effects in a proton conductor, uh, which contains barium, zirconium, cerium, yttrium, and oxygen. And uh, in those slides, I have shown the measured versus lattice harmonic lattice dynamic simulated um, width of momentum distribution. So you could translate it into the magnitudes of uh, nuclear quantum effects of zero point energy. And you can see that in some cases, the experiment is above. In some cases, the experiment is be below the values predicted by lattice dynamics. If you go into the theory of unharmonicity in the perovskite oxide systems, there is a general result um, uh, saying that mode, mode hardening above the prediction from harmonic lattice dynamics is a signature of the presence of the aquatic uh, unharmonicity, whereby mode softening is a signature of the um, uh, presence of the cubic unharmonic term in the local potential. So by simply contrasting the measured and lattice dynamics predicted um, values of uh, zero point energy, we can characterize the interplay between different types of um, uh, unharmonicity um, as the temperature changes and phase changes occur in the system. Um, one of the very um, profound realizations by both theoreticians and experimentalists of the progress made in the last 10 years has been that we can characterize the strengths of the local nuclear quantum effects using the effective temperature. Because 
mathematically, analytically speaking, the shape of the momentum distribution of a nuclear quantum particle subjects to a potential is actually the, the same, can be expressed in the same analytical mathematical form as in the Maxwell Boltzmann um, distribution, where you only can change the temperature from the thermodynamic temperature to the uh, effective temperature, which is related to the strength of the binding and confinement of the, of the uh, quantum particle. The bio you can actually introduce a new um, observable, which is uh, referred to as quantum excess, which is the ratio of the um, kin nuclear kinetic energy measured or simulated from experiment to the um, Maxwell Boltzmann nuclear kinetic energy that would have uh, uh, been exhibited by this particle at um, the temperature at which the measure measurement, the uh, temp temperature at which the measurement has been performed. This ratio uh, can uh, give you loads of insights uh, into the local properties of uh, materials and give you actually quite a lot of surprises because um, contrary to the naive expectation, um, nuclei that are much heavier then um, protons still exhibit a marked magnitude of nuclear quantum effects as investigated in this example of nuclear dynamics in metastable phase of solid acid um, uh, cesium hydrogen sulfate. In this case, we have measured this quantum excess in an atom um, resolved manner using new, uh, neutron Compton scattering. And we have discovered that uh, actually um, in case of sulfur, this quantum, this, the, the value of the quantum excess is much higher than the value of the quantum excess for much lighter uh, oxygen atom. So uh, sulfur is in a way much more quantum um, uh, than, than oxygen, uh, even at room temperatures. And this is, as we believe, we interpret this actually quite geta to unexplored nuclear quantum effect um, as arising from a tighter, tighter binding environment, which confines um, uh, the uh, wave function basically of the sulfur in, um, in this material. And this, this would be the nuclear kinetic energy of confinement, which uh, uh, is quite important in current studies of metastable systems like glasses. Um, another um, property, nuclear quantum property that can be referred to the quantum axis is the quantum harmonic force constant of the mean effective force that is acting on a nucleus. Uh, in a solid stem system. And actually it can be shown that this uh, quantum harmonic force constant would have been zero if it wasn't for the fact that uh, we have a quantum excess. Um, we can use this observable to numerically transform the longitudinal um, momentum distribution, which is on, shown on the left-hand side of the slide, to the distribution of the adjoint observable, which is the observable in the position space, which is the projection of the um, displacement of the nuclear displacement of a nucleus from its equilibrium position to the, um, on the direction of the uh, uh, momentum transfer uh, from the neutrons scattered of the nucleus. And we can plot it um, as a function of this displacement and by basically directly from experiment inferring whether the system is um, uh, exhibiting a market amount of unharmonicity um, by measuring from experiment directly the deviation from linear dependence of the force uh, uh, from the displacement. So this is yet another manifestation of the fact that nuclear uh, Compton scattering can give you directly model free from experiment measures of not only the magnitude of nuclear quantum effects, the shape of um, uh, local Born-Oppenheimer potential, but also um, signatures of unharmonicity of um, nuclei inside the bonds. Um, what else? We can use isotope effects um, just because the inher inherent nature of neutron Compton scattering is a mass result. Different isotopes of the same atom would have um, recoil peaks um, broadened by the individual momentum distributions at different time of flight values because the time of flight technique is used to measure them. So I have plotted here a couple of examples whereby I um, plotted the um, recoil peaks of most um, resolved uh, nuclei that would have been resolved in time of light spectra of Vesuvio. So we have hydrogen and deuterium, lithium-6, lithium-7, and boron 
10 and boron 11. Um, all those isotopes are very well resolved in the time of light. The peak width would be proportional to the uh, uh, zero point energies exhibited uh, by the nu nuclei and can be actually directly inferred from experiment and compared to say harmonic uh, local harmonic uh, potential um, expectations, thereby allowing us to characterize uh, the degree of unharmonicity or uh, the, the degree of uh, isotope mass disorder uh, inside of the system. And this actually uh, can be also done um, not only from experiment, but can be modeled. If you have a good model of your atom projected vibrational densities of states, you can use the combination of um, the expression giving us the uh, variance of the momentum distribution and the root mean square displacement of the nucleus uh, through uh, the um, atomic atom projected vibrational densities of states together with the virial theorem for the harmonic oscillator to come up with an expression for the magnitude of the effective force constant that can be simulate, simulated based on uh, the results for your vibrational density of states and contrasted with the results from experiment. An attempt like this has been performed uh, to characterize positional isotopic mass and force constant disorder in, um, in, in glassy systems, in um, systems which are not entirely uh, uh, stable from the point of view of local structure and exhibit a lot of uh, isotopic disorder due to the presence of different um, isotopes of molybdenum and neodymium. What is possible is to simulate the, dis uh, the disorder of force constant uh, caused by the disorder of the um, isotopic masses based on the either harmonic lattice prediction or any other prediction of um, uh, atom projected vibrational densities of states and actually compare it to what experiments uh, give you. Um, there are very interesting results showing that there are, for instance, non-monotonic relationships between the magnitude of the disorder of the force constants and the temperature and uh, some of the uh, nuclei exhibit actually more market uh, uh, nonlinear relationships between the magnitude of disorder and temperature than the others, which is one of the signatures of the stability of the whole system as a function of temperature. Uh, in terms of uh, isotope effects uh, as seen by, by uh, neutron Compton scattering, uh, two very important uh, applications are uh, transport processes and quantum sieving. As we know, um, quantum sieving uh, occurs uh, for hydrogen and deuterium in organic uh, porous materials when the difference between the linear size of the hydrogen and uh, deuterium um, molecule um, is more or less in the range of um, uh, thermal de Broglie wavelength. And due to the interplay of this thermal de Broglie wavelength and the geometric constraints, we have uh, kinetic quantum sieving. So Vesuvia would be very well equipped to measure selectively um, the amounts of zero point energy broadening of hydrogen and deuterium adsorbed in a, in a system like this as a function of temperature and um, uh, gas adsorption. Uh, obviously, as far as transport processes are concerned, we can talk about um, interplay of different modes, uh, either those modes that are parallel to the reaction coordinates or the bonds, the modes that are perpendicular to them. Um, one of them can be called killer modes, the other can be called nurse, nursing or helper modes. And obviously the interplay between those modes and the nuclear quantum effects of those modes will uh, have a decisive uh, influence on the um, non-classical uh, transport processes, such as uh, quantum version of the of the Grothfuss mechanism in which the proton transfer is actually by virtue of uh, uh, tunneling as rather than classical hopping. Um, in terms of challenges for um, further uh, development of the technique and, and computation centered around this, let me start by stating that actually very often one of the winning combination in terms of benchmarking of experimental results with theoretical uh, predictions is a combination whereby consistently uh, we're trying to fit globally uh, diffraction in elastic neutron scattering, uh, neutron Compton scattering, 
um, uh, data to DFT predictions. And uh, those DFT predictions uh, sometimes even suffice to be at the level of uh, lattice dynamics, especially for heavier nuclei. And this allows us to characterize uh, roughly the system. This is the starting point for any other further co uh, consideration in terms of modeling of uh, zero point energies and nucle other nuclear quantum effects. Um, this is usually where we start from. This is sometimes where we are also successful where we, uh, we can already draw conclusions. Nevertheless, obviously there are challenges beyond harmonic lattice dynamics. One of them is to predict exact shape of nuclear momentum distributions um, that cannot be sometimes elucidated from harmonic lattice dynamics. And what comes to rescue here is the existence of uh, sophisticated methods of ab initio molecular dynamics, um, especially those that use um, uh, quantum thermostati thermostating uh, for uh, the description of the um, coupling of the random, uh, random force to the environment. Uh, the chief idea here is to mimic the quantumness of the nuclear degrees of freedom by uh, using the general Langevin equation um, uh, that basically uh, has um, a property that the spectral density of the autocorrelation function of the random force exhibits the same um, shape in frequency as the spectral density of the excitations of the quantum harmonic oscillator. The, uh, those simulations are quite challenging. They are quite time consuming, required loads of computational power. And the problem that is associated with them is that quantum thermostating um, is uh, plagued by um, spurious couplings between high and low frequency modes due to the uh, unharmonicity in the systems that are being uh, simulated. And those couplings distort the shape of atom projected vibrational densities of states beyond uh, this, which can be realistically ascribed to the properties of the system that we are trying to, mo to simulate. Um, those uh, couplings, those spurious couplings, parasitic couplings are referred to as uh, zero point energy leakage. And in order to avoid this, we would have to actually uh, go beyond the uh, quantum thermostated ab initio molecular dynamics. But somehow, uh, in some cases, we are actually quite successful by describing nuclear dynamics of lightweight nuclei in condensed water system at this level, going uh, um, at the level of quantum thermostated ab initio molecular dynamics. One of the Examples here is the um, nuclear dynamics of protons in hydrogen bonds and um, in um, solid formic acid, whereby using a combination of NCS, INS, neutron diffraction, um, and benchmarking carefully the experimental results of momentum distributions against the three different methodologies, starting from harmonic lattice dynamics, then performing ab initio molecular dynamics, and finally quantum thermostated ab initio molecular dynamics, we are able to solve a 50-year-old mystery about the uh, coexistence of two different crystallographic phases uh, that was proposed by Zeltzman 50 years ago. The, there was a proposition that the um, uh, there exist two different phases, beta one and beta two, differing only on the position of the hydrogen at left or right from the center of the hydrogen bond, which in reality was actually um, a, a wrong uh, interpretation. As we have shown, uh, there is no phase coexistence. There is a broad delocalization of the proton across the hydrogen bond, and there is one quantum phase of, of formic acid at, at this temperature, no phase transition between two uh, um, uh, substructures that would have been anyway related by very, very small uh, amount of uh, energy um, the, in the order of uh, kilojoules per mole. Uh, sometimes going uh, beyond quantum thermostated molecular dynamics is necessary if we uh, have systems which are deeply quantum at low temperatures with very high local modes of vibrations. There is no other choice by using, but other than using path integral molecular dynamics methods. And unfortunately here, the challenge of simulating uh, momentum distributions is actually a double challenge because not only have, to, have we 
uh, got to use path integral molecular dynamics, which is a very computationally intensive technique, uh, order of magnitude more intense than uh, uh, lattice dynamics and a couple of times more intense than ab initial molecular dynamics. But also in terms of simulating momentum distributions, we have to actually open the path because we are talking about uh, momentum dependent observables that require very complicated estimators that depend on replica replica correlations um, that should be computed, computed on open paths. So uh, any use of uh, ring polymer centroid or uh, closed path uh, uh, integral molecular dynamics is an approximation in, uh, when you want to simulate exact shape and correlations of mo nuclear momenta inside of a, um, a quantum system. Uh, nevertheless, there is a plethora of approximate methods based on ring polymer centroid and closed path uh, uh, integral molecular dynamics that have been quite successful in recent uh, decades to uh, approach uh, accuracy, which would give predictive power for experimental results and actually would be very close to experimental results. So in terms of, in terms of uh, challenges, we have two types of challenges. We have computational challenges, uh, as I already mentioned, fine details of momentum distribution still require open path integral molecular dynamics uh, with quite heroic uh, computations on the horizon for anybody who would like to tackle uh, uh, this, um, uh, Exper describe experimental results using PIMD formalism. Um, even beyond that, simulating mom momentum distributions in disordered system is still huge. It's, it's a huge challenge because not only do we have to use open path uh, 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 integral molecular dynamics, but also in uh, replicas of randomly generated um, supercells that would mimic the disorder in the system, which is actually beyond current computational capabilities of any supercomputing um, center, I would, I would say. Um, also, even beyond that, addressing particle exchange effects is still beyond reach uh, for computational methods to uh, describe systems, nuclear quantum um, effects in pr uh, presence of particle exchange effects. Uh, beyond computational challenges, of course, we have experimental ones, any experimentalist uh, would always wish to have more efficient detect detection schemes of epithermal neutrons, higher signal to noise ratio, increased mass resolution uh, is also highly desired in neutron Compton scattering in order to be able to characterize uh, the shape of momentum distribution, not only for lightweight, but also medium or heavyweight uh, nuclei beyond the half wave at half maximum, just the detailed shape of uh, momentum distributions of those heavier nuclei. And <clears throat> obviously sample environment uh, is always uh, subject to constant improvements. One of the frontiers of the future is um, measuring nuclear quantum effects in solid state systems under pressure when you can think of a symbolic, uh, symbolic frontier of one gigapascal for achievement of um, measurements under uh, conditions at which those nuclear quantum effects would be markedly uh, more pronounced than those at, at room temperature and uh, ambient pressure. And this, of course, is our next vision and our next challenge uh, beyond what we have already achieved in the last 10 years. If you want to hear or, or see more about the challenges of both computational and experimental techniques, there are three um, um, uh, literature positions that I could uh, recommend, obviously, we were trying to address those uh, challenges, writing review uh, articles and books about nuclear quantum effects in recent years. One of them was published a couple of years ago in Advances in Physics that summarizes challenges and state of the art of electron volt neutron spectroscopy beyond fundamental systems. The other one is um, uh, a publication in um, it's, in, it's uh, about atomic quantum dynamics in material research uh, in a um, uh, series on neutron scattering applications in biology, chemistry, and material science that was edited by Felix Fernandez Alonso and David Price. And last but not least, we have organized um, three years ago a very uh, successful meeting, seventh meeting of uh, uh, 
uh, international workshop on electron volt neutron spectroscopy that was held in Rome with presentations from more than 60 uh, researchers, including very prominent ones shaping the landscape of uh, computational um, methodology like Roberto Carr and, and uh, also chief experimentalist measuring nuclear quantum effects in uh, solid state systems and, and molecules. So you are more than welcome to uh, um, visit the website, which is still active, and uh, look up uh, those um, monographies, those uh, uh, positions in, in literature, summarizing the challenges of computational experimental uh, uh, nuclear quantum effects, uh, aspects of measurements of nuclear quantum effects. So uh, I would like to thank you for your attention at this point, and I would like to uh, take your questions if you have any. And of, of course, there are some slides. Thank you. thank you very much, Matthew, for a very, very comprehensive uh, journey through nuclear quantum effects and neutrons. Uh, are there any questions? If I can see. So Matthew, I have a question for you concerning if there are no other questions, otherwise I'll wait here on on the chat to see if anybody raises their hand. Um, otherwise I'll ask you a question. Um, what sort of systems for this one GPA barrier you have mentioned, what sort of systems do you think could be immediately amenable to the uh, I'm I'm having difficulty speaking up the question because uh, of the volume so what, of what, for this one GPA, few GPA yes. uh, limit right now of the technique. Um, what sort of systems do you have in mind? Well, uh, obviously uh, the systems at at, at at high pressure that would uh, uh, actually profit from nuclear quantum effect view uh, would be uh, systems that exhibit uh, superconductivity, uh, those uh, containing medium weight uh, nuclei like uh, uh, magnesium uh, and uh, possibly exhibiting uh, effects of correlations of motions of electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom. So one could uh, uh, expect that the isotope effects in those systems would be affect, affected even more under pressure, uh, under high pressure as at ambient com conditions. Obviously, the other category of systems are uh, perov perovskite and perovskite oxide functional materials under pressure uh, that exhibit a plethora of phase. Uh, uh, of different phases and the phase behavior of those systems. One, one of them is, for instance, MAPI. It's very complicated. And uh, high pressure, this system, which is actually inherently metastable in nature, could be um, very precisely characterized by mass resolved uh, Compton spectrometry just because we have uh, different nuclei that we can resolve in time of light spectra that would exhibit enhanced. Uh, uh, nuclear quantum effects under pressure. Other perovskite oxide systems like ferroelectrics, uh, the systems that are characterized with bistable bonds uh, uh, in which uh, hydrogen is embedded. And this hydrogen bonds uh, most likely would be characterized by high degree of, of tunneling at uh, low temperatures and high pressure values. Maybe last okay. but not least, some, some quantum crystals like lithium hydride and um, some uh, quantum liquids and under pressure. Yeah, we, we've got a question from Emilio Artacho, I think. Yes. Emilio, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, can I can hear you. much better now, yes. Okay, um, it just uh, precisely on the, oh, thank you very much. It was a very, very nice talk. Uh, just on the systems, some of the systems you were mentioning, uh, 
some of them, the quantum fluctuations, the quantum effects uh, that you're seeing locally, uh, and the physics of them, uh, there can be correlation between replicas of them. So for instance, if you have, you mentioned a ferroelectric in which the hydrogen would be in between two possible states, mm. its fluctuations from one side to another would be coupled to the fluctuations of the same hydrogen just uh, in the next position, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, it, of course, that's part of what will be happening, but can you see anything from your experiments telling you uh, any, any kind of uh, indications of these correlations happening or the strength or anything like that? Well, uh, I think uh, that the, the most uh, prominent uh, and most visible observable in terms of nuclear quantum effects is still the, the, the magnitude of zero point energy, which is directly am amenable to experimental scrutiny. And actually this should be, should be slightly modified, I guess, in terms of such a coupling. There is also a talk in literature about zero point energy resonance stabilization of structures. Uh, there is a group from uh, from uh, Oak Ridge, actually, uh, a neutron source that has published a physical review letter paper on um, actually um, uh, organic systems where they suspect that such uh, correlations of uh, zero point energy fluctuations stabilize the structure. So one could even see something in diffraction, I guess. Uh, uh, but uh, beyond the sheer amount of zero point energy, I would say it would require extensive modeling to, to be able to benchmark those effects against, against experiments. Because I think um, just from, from you know, inferring the shape of uh, momentum distribution without any underlying theoretical exp explanation and you know, benchmarking against open path uh, integral molecular dynamic simulations would be actually quite difficult because there are many you, you, uh, usual suspects, you have many different candidate effects that could shape the, the magnitude of zero point energy that, that could be taken into account. So they need to be pruned out or singled out by you know, carefully comparing predictions from different, uh, from different theoretical uh, modeling. Um, so I guess, I guess that's a broad answer to your question, if I may. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emilio. Um, I don't see any further questions on the uh, chat. Let me just check now. Uh, if, no more, we, if we have no more questions, a profuse thank you to Matthew for, for this presentation, for this seminar, as well as to everybody who has attended it today. And with that, I think we can conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, thanks.